Hey class, I'm Mr Thornton and this is a combined Get That C and Top Grade Top Up video where we're going to be looking at homeostasis. In this part we're going to focus on the kidneys and the renal system. This topic was requested by Kim Wiyuel, Lana Stainton, Sharkisha, Shady, Lauren Cook, Miss Cheeky G, Siakira Erwan, Maboob Ullah, Abdullah Jamal, Rhett Bateman and Alex Graham. Thanks guys. If there's a topic you'd like me to cover, then just leave a comment below. Homeostasis is all about how your body maintains its own internal conditions. Now those internal conditions include things like blood sugar levels and temperature regulation, and I'm going to cover those topics in later videos. In this video, I'm going to focus specifically on the kidneys and the renal system. And they have a pair of roles. They're helping get rid of some of the waste because they're part of the excretory system and they're also helping maintain the correct water levels in your body. So they've got a dual role and we're going to be looking at both of those. Of course, your body produces various different waste products as a result of the various life processes that are keeping you alive. And it needs to get rid of those. A good example is carbon dioxide, which is produced when you respire. The key one which the kidneys are involved with is a waste product called urea, which is produced in the liver. As proteins are digested into amino acids and then they're metabolized, they produce ammonia. And ammonia is a fairly toxic chemical. And so the liver combines ammonia with carbon dioxide to form urea. And it then needs to get rid of that compound called urea. And so the kidneys are responsible for making sure that that urea passes out of your body. And that's what we're going to focus on for a start. Urea travels from the liver to the kidneys via the blood plasma. Once the blood plasma reaches the kidneys, it then gets filtered and various compounds are filtered out of that blood plasma. Water, dissolved ions, that's salts, uh, glucose, and the urea which we're interested in. So those four things are going to be filtered out of the main bloodstream and that blood can then move back around the body. Now those things which have been filtered out are then actually mainly reabsorbed back into the bloodstream but the kidneys control the amounts which are reabsorbed. Uh, most of the glucose will be reabsorbed pretty much straight away. Some of the salts may be absorbed. The amount of water which is reabsorbed is carefully controlled to help maintain your level of hydration to keep you getting from dehydrated. And the urea doesn't actually get reabsorbed at all. That's a pure waste product. Anything that's left over from this process then passes down into the bladder and it can be released from your body the next time you go to the toilet. Now everyone needs to know that overview, but here's where things get a little bit more complicated because not all exam boards cover the same amount of content. For example, if you're doing foundation tier with AQA on their current specification, that's the one which you'll be sitting exams in in 2016, then that's all that you need to know. For higher tier, you need to understand a little bit about the hormone which is involved in regulating the process of the amount of water which is in your body, but you don't need to understand the inner workings of the kidney. Some other exam boards, though, do expect you to understand the inner workings of the kidney. Edexcel, for example, needs you to know an awful lot more detail. Now, there's no guarantee about which exam board you're on. I don't know which exam board you're sitting. So what you need to do is check this carefully with your teacher. They are the people who will know exactly what you need to know. Or if you're not sure and you want to double check, then ask them exactly which exam specification you're sitting and you'll be able to go to that exam board's website. You'll be able to download it and check exactly which bits you need. So if for example, you only need that basic overview, then you can skip straight ahead. And if you click just here, you can do that. You can skip straight ahead to finding out what happens if there's a problem with the kidneys. If you're doing higher tier, then you actually need to understand the whole process of osmoregulation. That is controlling the water content. And so you can click just here to do that. If, however, you're on a board like, like at Excel, where you need to understand the structure of the internal workings of the kidney, in particular things like the nephrons, then stick with me and I'm going to go through that now. So let's take a closer look at what's going on with the kidneys. 
Firstly, they're supplied by the renal artery. Remember, arteries are those thicker walled, higher pressure blood vessels, and they're the blood vessels which supply pretty much every organ. And organs are then drained by veins. In this case, the kidneys would be drained by the renal vein. So that will be blood which needs to be purified, passing down the renal artery, and then that purified blood, that filtered blood, which will be drained away by the renal vein. Once it reaches the kidney, it passes into one of these things. This is a nephron. Each kidney contains around about a million of these in our species. So these are microscopic, but they serve a really, really important role. They're a relatively complicated bit of biology, but mainly what they are is a jumble of leaky tubes. Try and keep that in mind. The first few leaky tubes which we focus on are what we call the glomerulus. This is where the blood supply goes in. And there are really fine capillaries which allow the substances which are going to pass out of the bloodstream, which we want to filter out of the bloodstream, they allow those to get out. So it's going to be those dissolved ions or salts, it's going to be the dissolved glucose, it's going to be the urea, and it's going to be the water which pass out of the glomerulus. The rest of the stuff in the blood, so the blood cells and the larger proteins and things, all of those can't actually fit through this filter. And so most of the blood doesn't actually get filtered, but some of the things that we want to filter out do get filtered out. And they pass into this next stage, which is known as Bowman's capsule. Bowman's capsule doesn't really do anything other than collect those things which have been filtered out, something that we call a filtrate. A filtrate is just something which has been filtered out from some sort of solution. So we've got a filtrate in Bowman's capsule. From here, it then passes along this thing called the tubule. Tubule just means that it's a tube. It's sometimes actually referred to as the convoluted tubule, which means a twisty tube. As you can see, it is quite a twisty tube. And so that filtrate, that solution of sugar and ions and urea in water passes along here. As it passes along here, this is yet another leaky tube. Things are going to pass back out of it. And there are capillaries running alongside it, which allow all the stuff which is passed back out of it to be reabsorbed into the bloodstream again. So the first thing which is reabsorbed pretty much immediately is the glucose. All of that passes more or less straight out. So you've then got a solution which contains those dissolved ions and the urea and water. And that makes its way along the tubule. And then you get to another really key part which you need to know the name of. This is the loop of Henle. Now the loop of Henle is really the important bit when it comes to the regulation of the amount of water in your body. Because what's going on in the loop of Henle is that it lets water pass out, again another leaky tube, but the amount of water which it lets pass out can be controlled. I'll come back to that in just a moment. You also may get some of these dissolved ions passing out, you may not, the urea shouldn't be getting out of here, and then it makes its way finally to this tube which collects it and then passes it down into the bladder. The tube going down into the bladder is known as the ureter, and then the bladder is drained by the urethra. Understanding how hormones control the process of water reabsorption in the kidneys is something which is sometimes a higher tier skill, or it's sometimes something which you need to know even if you're doing the foundation tier. It varies again from exam board to exam board. So again, double check this part with your teacher to find out whether you need to know all the details or not. But it's controlled by something called antidiuretic hormone, or ADH. And this is produced by the pituitary gland. This is a gland which produces all sorts of hormones. If you watch my video on the menstrual cycle, for example, you'll see that an awful lot of the control of that process is done by the pituitary gland and hormones which are produced there as well. But in this case, it's the ADH which is important. Now what the ADH does is controls the amount of water which is reabsorbed by the kidneys. If you're becoming dehydrated, the pituitary gland releases more ADH. And what effect that ADH has is mainly found in the loop of Henle here, within the kidneys. What happens is the loop of Henle becomes more porous. It allows more water to pass back out of it and into the kidney to be reabsorbed back into the body, 
rather than making its way to the collecting duct here and finding its way to the bladder. So increasing ADH levels mean the kidney absorbs more water back into the body. It means that the urine which is produced is going to be much less watery. The reverse is true as well. If you've got an awful lot of water in your body, if you're very well hydrated, then what happens is that the pituitary releases less ADH, and so the kidney absorbs less water, and when you go to the loo, the urine is going to be much more watery because much more water is making its way through the kidneys without being reabsorbed and making its way into your bladder. So next time that you have science after lunch, you've drunk a lot of water, but your teacher won't let you go to the loo, what you need to do is explain that your pituitary gland is detecting how well hydrated you are. It's restricting the amount of ADH which is being released because there's a negative feedback loop in play here. As a result, in your kidneys, the loop of Henle in every nephron is becoming less porous, you're reabsorbing less water, and the collecting duct is then passing all that water down your ureter into your bladder, which is why you really need to go so badly. Remember to use the phrase negative feedback. That means that as hydration levels increase, the amount of ADH being released by the pituitary gland falls. And in response to it falling, the kidneys then allow more of that water to pass out. As the level of water drops, then the amount of ADH increases again, and the reverse is true. That's what we call a negative feedback loop. Now, it's possible when you say this to your teacher that they might give you another piece of negative feedback and say no, that you can't go to the loo, but it's worth a try. A little bit of applied knowledge to impress them could go a long way. Finally, let's take a look at what happens if there's a problem with the kidneys. Firstly, dialysis. In dialysis, a machine is used to replicate the function of the kidneys. The patient's blood is pumped out of their body and it runs along one side of a semi-permeable membrane or a partially permeable membrane and on the other side is the dialysis fluid. The dialysis fluid contains all the correct concentrations of the dissolved substances which should be in the blood but it doesn't contain any urea. So urea will diffuse across into the dialysis fluid and be removed from the body. Which sounds quite good in principle, but there are a few problems. Firstly, a dialysis machine is a big, expensive piece of machinery. A kidney is about this big, and you've got a pair of them in your body normally. So the machine isn't all that efficient a replacement. The patient also needs to be connected to this for several hours each week, and they need to keep going back to this repeatedly. And also, it isn't good as a long-term strategy. It'll work in a short term, but as a practical solution in the long term, it isn't really effective. So it's much better if we can get a kidney replacement instead. And that's what kidney transplants are for. As I say, you've got a pair of kidneys, so it's possible to remove one of a healthy donor's kidneys and leave the other one still in there, and it wouldn't kill them. Kidneys are essential for getting rid of those waste products. Without them, you can't survive very long but you can still survive with one. Now that does restrict a few things. It restricts what sorts of foods you can eat and it's something which people have got to be quite careful about. It does involve a lifestyle change, but you can still live with only one kidney. So it's something which can be transplanted relatively easily, except that your body has an immune system and if you put any sort of foreign tissue in there, your immune system tends to attack it. The way the immune system recognises when there's some sort of foreign tissue in there is that your cells are coated with special proteins called antigens. And these are different from person to person. When people talk about what blood type they are, they're talking basically about the type of antigens coating the surface of the blood cells. So if you're going to have a successful transplant, you've got to get a match with someone who has the same type of antigens coating the surface of their cells. Getting the same blood type is good, it's a lot better if you can get someone who's closely related to the person who needs the transplant because they're much more likely to have a close tissue match. If they don't have a close tissue match, then unfortunately that tissue could be rejected. The organ which we're putting into a person to try and prolong their life and keep them alive will be attacked by their own immune system and that will probably kill that person, as well as destroying a perfectly good organ. In order to transplant the kidneys, and this is true for an awful lot of types of transplants, what you need to do is make sure that the donor has a tissue match. 
Unfortunately, since that's not always perfect, what doctors will also do is give the patient who's receiving the transplant immunosuppressant drugs. That is drugs which suppress how effective the immune system is. Of course, this can leave the patient open to infection whilst the patient's body accepts that new organ and starts using it, but that's a small price to pay for something like their kidney being replaced. I hope that video really helps you. If you want to check how well you understood, then try the SNAP quiz. The link is right here, and it'll also be in the description, along with all the other links for this video. If you want to check out my other videos, then click right here. If you want to download the free app I've made to help you with your revision, then you can click right here. If you want to subscribe to my channel, then you can click right here. Don't forget to leave likes, and if you go to the comments, you can give me feedback and let me know which topics you'd like me to cover next. Good luck in your GCSEs everyone, and thanks very much for watching.